everybody. How are we doing? Awesome. Continuing to be good. And National Book Festival is still going great? Awesome. I am so glad you are here to see yet another amazing author presentation. And it's my honor to introduce this particular author. Uh, first, my name is Sasha Dowdy. I work in the Library of Congress Young Reader Center. Young Reader Center is a really special place for kids and teens and families to come in, read some books, relax, and learn about the treasures and beautiful collection in the largest library in the world. We also do field trips and help kids and school groups come in for author programs, so stay tuned to see what the library has coming up soon. Now. Our special guest today is Victoria V.E. Schwab, and she is the number one New York Times USA and indie best-selling author of more than a dozen books, including Vicious, Shades of Magic series, and This Savage Song. Her work has received critical acclaim and lots of compliments for fans and critics alike. She's been featured by EW and the New York Times. She, her books have been translated into more than a dozen languages, and her works have even been optioned for TV and film. She has a really good understanding of what people of all ages might enjoy, and her books really show that understanding. She also knows how to make the hair stand on ends and how to make your heart flutter all the way up to the ceiling. So there's a lot of really good, delicious stuff in her books. If you haven't read Victoria's books, you should really check out really famous series like Everyday Angels, The Monster of Verity, and The Steel Prince comic series. Today, Victoria is talking about Tunnel of Bones, the second book in the Cassidy Blake series. So the first one is about a girl who had a scary experience and discovered that she can pull back the veil that separates the living from the dead. And she even gets a best friend who's a ghost. And in the second book, she goes to Paris and discovers something really creepy going on underground. So I'm not going to tell you anymore. You'll have to hear it from the author's mouth. And I am so excited to introduce Victoria Schwab and let's give her a really spirited welcome. So is there a clicker? <laughs> this, this is the clicker? Just, and this just goes forward. Hi. Okay, I think I'm gonna have a PowerPoint, but I'm not sure. There we go. That's me, but I don't know if that's my PowerPoint. There we go. Okay. Okay, show of hands. Do you believe in ghosts? Raise your hand. Okay. Okay, good. It's okay if you don't, and it's okay if you do. Cassidy Blake, the star of this series, would say that it's really easy to not believe in ghosts until you meet one, and then it's really hard not to believe in them anymore. I personally believe in ghosts, or at least I think I do. I believe in something. I have definitely walked into places and felt the hair on my arms stand on end. I have um, been lying in bed at night and felt doors open and close around the house. I even lived in a haunted house one year, and there was a man who lived in this house who used to walk the path upstairs from his bedroom to his bathroom every morning and every night. And by the time I lived in there, the guy was gone, but you could still feel and hear the footsteps twice a day overhead. And I never met that particular ghost, and I'm kind of glad because I scare really, really easily, which might sound funny because I write books about scary things. I write books about things that go bump in the dark. Um, and one of those books is City of Ghosts. So that's the first book in the Cassidy Blake series. And you heard a little bit about it. But I'm going to tell you the rest. City of Ghosts is a book about the things that people cannot see and about a girl who can see them. So her name is Cassidy. And before the book started, she drowned or she almost drowned, she would have drowned, except a boy saved her life. A boy named Jacob pulled her out of the river. And the problem is that Jacob was a ghost. And so when Jacob saved Cassidy's life, when he pulled her back into the land of the living, she pulled him out of the land of the dead. And now their lives are super tangled up. And because of him, or maybe because of the fact she almost drowned, she can now pull aside the veil between the living and the dead. And she can see ghosts. And they can see her. 
Now, Cassidy's parents don't know about this new talent, which is ironic because they are professional ghost hunters, or at least they are ghost searchers. Her mom writes novels about ghosts, and her dad is a scholar of the paranormal, and they have just been hired to film a television show about the world's most haunted cities. And Cassidy has to come along, which is not the way that she planned on spending her summer vacation. And their first stop in City of Ghosts is Edinburgh, Scotland. Now, Edinburgh, Scotland is one of the most haunted places in the entire world. And I should know, I live there year round. And it's the kind of place that's not necessarily scary, but it's the kind of place where everybody that you meet has a ghost story. You'll meet a cab driver with a ghost story. You'll meet a, a person who works in a shop with a ghost story. Everyone you pass on the street, if you ask them for one, they'll be able to tell you a ghost story. And proof of this is I told my friend that I was going to write a ghost story set in Scotland. And my friend, the first thing she said was, oh, I've got a ghost story for you. And, and that's kind of the way it works. Everyone has a ghost story. So this is the one that she told me. She says, my husband and I were visiting a castle in, in Scotland, right? And we've been told that the castle was haunted. Now we did a tour around the entire castle. We went into all the rooms and all of the halls and all of the stairs, and we didn't see any ghosts. But it was still a very nice castle. And so we decided to go to the castle kitchens after we were done because the castle kitchens had been converted into kind of like a restaurant. And so they went into the castle kitchens and it was beautiful and it was old and there was a hearth, a big fireplace with three chairs set around it in a U. And two of the chairs were empty and there was a man sitting in the third chair beside the fire. Now my friend and her husband were carrying their drinks past the three chairs and she accidentally knocked into the chair where the man was sitting. And he turned and he looked up at her and he scowled and she said, I'm so sorry. And her husband turned around and said, who are you talking to? Because of course the chair was empty. The fact is everyone you meet has a story to tell you about Scotland. And they're not always scary, but they're just everywhere. Everyone has glimpsed something out of the corner of their eye or places that just felt a little wrong, a little like a cold breath on the back of your neck. So I want to ask you, what do you think that a ghost looks like? I want you to close your eyes for a second. Now I can see you, so you actually have to close your eyes because the lights are off, right? I want you to close your eyes and I want you to imagine exactly where you are right now, exactly where you're sitting, but instead of the seat beside you or the space in front of you or behind you being empty, I want you to imagine that there's something there. I want you to imagine that the world around you, the space around you is a little bit grayer and a little bit emptier except for this thing right beside you. And so you have to ask yourself, what does the thing look like? Is it a monster? Is it scary? Is it shaped like whatever kid was sitting in the seat where you're sitting now? Is it shaped like a stranger or a friend? So you could open your eyes, all right? In Cassidy's world, the veil, the space where the ghosts are, isn't somewhere else. It's right here, exactly where you are. There's just a curtain separating it from you. And in Cassidy's world, when you go through the veil, the world on the other side is a little grayer and is a little emptier, and the ghosts that she meets don't know that they're ghosts. The vast majority of them are just going through the motions of the last days or the last moments of their lives. But every now and then, one of the ghosts knows that it's dead. And every now and then, one of the ghosts wants to get out of the veil. And that's what happens when Cassidy gets to Scotland, is she meets a ghost that not only knows it's a spirit, but it has an idea for how it's going to get back into the land of the living. And it involves Cassidy. Now, writing a story in Scotland is very easy. As I said, the ghosts are everywhere. Every alley you walk down has one. I could go to Greyfriars Kirk. This is the map from the book, right? That's how many ghost stories I talk about in, in the book. But I could go to Greyfriars Kirk, which is a very famous um, 
there it is, that's a graveyard. And there's a very mean spirit in the graveyard of a man whose bones were dug up by a pair of kids who thought it would be fun to play with them. And now he sits in the corner of the graveyard and he scowls at everyone who comes in. And I can go to Southbridge. This is just a picture from a window in my city. And the thing about Southbridge is that they were building the bridge and they wanted to have somebody really fancy go across first. And so they decided that the mayor's wife was gonna be the one to go across the bridge, that that was gonna usher in this bridge. Now the problem is that the mayor's wife died three days before the bridge was done. But the Scottish are fairly superstitious and so they decided that they still needed the mayor's wife to be the one to go across the bridge first. And so they ferried her casket from one side of the bridge to the other and that was the way that they opened the South Bridge. Now, everywhere in Edinburgh has these stories. They're very obvious and they're very on the surface. It was a really easy place to start. But I knew that when I wrote the second book, I wanted to set it somewhere very different. Tunnel of Bones is set in Paris, France. And I don't know if you know very much about Paris, France, but if you know much about it, you might think it's, it looks like this. It's very beautiful and it's very light and there are croissants and pastries and there are gardens and parks. Everything that you hear about Paris, France is fun and beautiful and golden. And the fact is that Paris is also one of the most haunted places in the world. But the ghosts in Paris don't always wander the streets. They live under the ground. That's because Paris, France is home to one of the scariest places in the world, the catacombs. Now the catacombs exist under Paris and they're far, far larger than you think they are. What happened is about 300, 250, 300 years ago, the graveyards in Paris were too full. There were too many bodies in the graveyards and they needed to do something about that. And so they decided they had these tunnels, these empty mining tunnels under Paris. And they thought, we'll just take all, the, all of the corpses from the graveyards and we'll hide them in the tunnels underneath the city. And this seemed like a good idea at the time. And so every night for years, they would go into the graveyards, which were too full, and they would ferry the dead and they would dump them into the tunnels under the city. Because the catacombs are what's called an ossuary. And an ossuary is a place where we hide bones, where we hold bones. So this is the entrance to the catacombs. And the sign over the door essentially says, stop, this is the empire of the dead. And this is a place underneath Paris. And I went to visit it because I have to go and visit every place that I talk about in all of my books. Now, I am super scared of places underground. And the Paris catacombs are five stories, so about 48 feet straight down underneath Paris. You take a single concrete stairway, and before you ever get to the Empire of the Dead, you see this. This tunnel is like six feet tall and it's wide enough for one person. That is my five foot tall mother in front of me in the catacomb. So she's a very small woman and that's how close she is to the ceiling. And eventually you get to the empire of the dead and you go through and you see this. And from a distance, you might think that it's just patterns, it's just stones, but the closer you get, the more you realize that those are skulls and bones, and they've been set up in the catacombs in patterns. They've been set up as decorations underneath the ground. And you might think there are a hundred bodies or a thousand bodies in the Paris catacombs. There are six million, which means in the Paris catacombs underneath the city, there are more than 1.2 billion bones. That is a lot of people. And that is a lot of bones. And so they fill the world underneath your feet. And so while you're thinking of Paris as this beautiful blue sky place with Eiffel Towers and pastries and rivers, every step you take in the city, you are probably walking over the top of the Paris catacombs. Needless to say, they are a very, very haunted place. And so I'm going to read you the moment when Cassidy and Jacob enter the Paris catacombs for the first time. 
It's not too scary. Okay. The bones are everywhere. They lie in the dirt walls, a sea of skeletons rising almost to the ceiling. They form platforms, rippling designs, a wave of skulls set on a backdrop of femurs, the morbid decoration stacked as high as I can see. Empty eye sockets stare out and jaws hang open. And some of the bones are broken and crumbling and others look startlingly fresh. If you squint hard enough, the pieces disappear and you're left with a pattern of wavering grays that could be stone instead of bone. Our shadows dance on the walls and I take photo after photo knowing the camera will only capture what's here, only see the real. But right now, the real is strange enough, strange and chilling and almost beautiful. And horrifying, adds Jacob. Don't forget horrifying. We round the corner and as if on cue, the EMF meter in mom's hand erupts from static into a high-pitched whine that echoes through the tunnels like a scream. Mom jumps and quickly switches the unit back off. Well, she says, her voice a little shaky. I, I think that says enough. I shiver, unsettled, and even Pauline is looking tense. Gee, what could possibly be making her nervous, muses Jacob. Is it the fact we're five stories underground, or that this tunnel is roughly the size of a coffin, or could it be that we're surrounded by six million bodies? Six million. It's a number so big it doesn't seem real. 270, that's a better number. Still a lot, but countable. 270 is the number of bones you have when you're born. Some of them fuse together as you grow, so by the time you're an adult, you have 206. Thanks, science class. So if the catacombs are home to more than six million bodies, how many bones? Six million times 206 is a lot. Too many to capture in a photograph. But picture this. It's enough bones to stack five feet high throughout every one of the tunnels under Paris. An empire of the dead as large as the city. The bodies unmarked and unknown. Jacob begins to sing beside me and it takes me a solid 30 seconds to realize what he's singing. The foot bones connected to the leg bone. The leg bones collected to the knee bone. Are you serious? I whisper under my breath. And he throws up his hands, just trying to have a sense of humor about this. So that's the moment when they first get to the catacombs, the moment when things first get to go wrong. And you can see, this is the map of the Paris hauntings. So every time I write one of these books, I go to all of the haunted places. This is just a handful of the ones that are in this book. I wanted to write out these two cities because they have such different relationships to ghosts. As I said, Edinburgh is a place that really embraces its haunted culture. But when you look up at Paris, you don't necessarily anticipate seeing this. You might not know that the Eiffel Tower, one of the most famous monuments, is also said to be home to a spirit who swings her legs over the edge from where she fell. You might not know that on one of the bridges, there's a woman whose spirit is frozen to death when she was waiting to pass secrets to her husband during World War II. Everywhere you go, you are walking on haunted stories. That's my favorite thing about it. You never know what you're going to find. And so the third book, the one that'll be out next year, is called Bridge of Souls. It's gonna be set in New Orleans, so back here in the United States. And I just wanna finish by telling you one of the newest ghost stories that's going to be in it. So New Orleans is home to 42 graveyards. That's a lot of graveyards for one city. And one of the most famous ones is called St. Louis Number no. One. Now a couple was visiting New Orleans and they were staying in a hotel and they were in the elevator when they came across a young woman traveling by herself. Now the couple and the woman got to talking and they said, we're gonna go out and we're gonna see some of New Orleans haunted things. We're gonna go to St. Louis number one. Do you wanna come with us? And the woman traveling by herself said, sure. That sounds like fun. And so the couple and the woman set out from the hotel and they walked through New Orleans and they got to St. Louis Cemetery. And it was beautiful, it was evening and they were wandering the aisles of these incredible crypts. And they turned back because they noticed that the young woman had stopped behind them. 
They noticed that she was standing in front of a grave all by herself. And they thought she must have lost someone there. And so they returned to the woman's side and they said, you know, is everything all right? And she looked down at the grave sadly and she said simply, that one's mine. And by the time they looked up again, there was no woman there, of course. And so I am so, so excited to tell you some brand new ghost stories, whether you're new to City of Ghosts in Edinburgh, or whether you're following me to Paris and learning about the catacombs, or whether you'll come with me next year and experience the Bridge of Souls. And if you don't believe in ghosts right now, that's okay. You don't have to, because as Cassidy says, it's hard to believe in ghosts until you see one, and then it's very hard not to. So thank you. Um, yeah, hopefully I haven't given you any nightmares. There are time for one or two questions if you have them, and if not, that's okay as well. Anyone, I believe in you. Yeah, come here. What's my favorite ghost story? That's so hard because one of my favorites is the one that I told about the castle, about the family and they were visiting the castle and they went into the kitchens and they saw the man sitting behind, before the hearth. But because what I love about that ghost story is that it's so normal and it's so creepy and there's a moment in it where you think that there's never going to be a ghost in this story and it's not the one that you anticipate. And so many of my stories are not about the ghost that you're expecting to see on the page, they're about the ghost that surprises you while you're waiting for the ghost that you're expecting to see on the page. Yeah. The first ghost story I found out about is I was traveling on vacation with my family and I didn't believe in ghosts at this point until I woke up and found one standing at the foot of my bed. So I think that's probably the first ghost story that I found out about that I believed in. Because I definitely believe that there's weirdness in the world and I believe there are things we can't always explain. But until that happened, I'm not sure I believed in ghosts. Yeah. Oh, that's a hard one. What inspired me to write this Savage Song, which is one of my slightly older books? This Savage Song is a book where violence begins to breed monsters, and it was honestly inspired by the fear that I felt when I looked around at our world and at our country, and I saw a lot of really scary things happening and a lot of violence happening and seeing no change. And so what it's really about is two young people trying to move through that world and trying to figure out how to take control when nothing feels like it's in your power. Yeah, last one. What would I do? Okay, if I saw a ghost, what would I do? I would absolutely hide under the blankets. That moment that I saw that ghost standing at the foot of my bed, I put all the blankets up over my face and I just said, I'm not here to hurt you. You keep doing what you're doing and we're gonna be completely fine. Like I am, I treat ghosts like unfriendly cats, which is like you just let them have their space and you have your space. But yeah, I would probably run away. I'm a total scaredy cat. It's why I write about scary things because then I'm in control of the story. But I scare so easily. And I think that's the last thing to remember is that the thing about these books is it's completely okay to be afraid. Like Casty Blake and Jacob are scared most of the book. They're just they're being brave even though they're afraid. And so it's about learning how to move through the world, not when you're not scared of anything, but when you are scared of things. So thank you guys so much. It was so nice to chat with you and I hope you check out my scary stories. <laughs>